everyone poured the coolest person they knew into a pot and Wendy was bored. The writers of Gravity Falls, across two seasons and 41 episodes, really had no clue what to do with one of their main cast members, Wendy Corduroy. Dipper's crush and the resident cool girl in town, Wendy was just that, really. She was Dipper's crush and the cool girl in town. She never got an opportunity to come into her own because the writers never <laughs> attempted- She never had the opportunity to come. <laughs> Well, you did a little pause there the first time you said it, and I was like, oh no, never? <laughs> <laughs> Not once? My friend Gretchen is sitting next to me, by the way. Hey, what's up? I'm Gretchen. I am a poorly written female character in real life. She never came into her own because the writers didn't make a true attempt to develop her character, and in fact because they created a character almost impossible to develop. We've all seen stories about like love interests that are just there to be a love interest and they're not a character. Right. And we were like just fighting as hard as we could to make Wendy like a real viable character that could have stories on her own and stuff. We always wanted to do a full Wendy episode and we That's never true. cracked one because I feel like part of it was this character that we've created here is so chill and likable yeah. That yeah. When you put her in a situation where you have to make her commit the sin where she has to learn 21 minutes of story, it was like, oh, it doesn't feel like that awesome Wendy we know. And it's like we wanted to honor her so much that we couldn't figure out the right episode with her because we didn't want to mess her up. To get to the bottom of the issue, we have to address why each of the five leads were incorporated into the story of Gravity Falls. During the Between the Pines special, series creator Alex Hirsch speaks in detail about the characters' inspirations. Dipper and Mabel were based on Alex and his twin sister Ariel while they were kids. Seuss is pretty much a direct life-to-screen translation of Hirsch's college buddy Jesus Chambro, while Stan takes his roots in Hirsch's grandpa Stan who was apparently one insane man. After over three minutes of interviews about those first four characters, of how it when I was around Dipper's age, oh, I when I was in middle school, she's not on camera in an episode. My twin sister, in I think sixth grade, Stan is based on my grandpa Stan. If you're rewatching oh, yeah. the series, you might understand the Definitely psychology. one of my favorite characters. Yeah, yeah. Sue starts saying those by someone I went to college. He would see you. Sincere I play. Wendy gets one sentence. Everyone poured the coolest person they knew into a pot and Wendy was bored. <laughs> Wendy? You're the coolest person I know. I know, dude. Tell me about it later. Alex, what about the other characters? And after listening to the audio commentaries on the DVD, it becomes very clear why her character doesn't warrant the same amount of passion. Me, me and Mike, you know, I think we both had our fair share of unrequited crushes when we were, you know, in middle school and high school. And Alex so, is like, a liar. I have 12 girlfriends right now. Dipper and Mabel exist because Hirsch wanted someone like him and Ariel in his show. Seuss and Stan exist because Hirsch wanted someone like Jesus and Grandpa Stan in his show. But Wendy exists not because the writers wanted a cool girl in town, but because the writers needed a love interest for Dipper. We knew that Dipper's crush on Wendy was going to be a big part of the show. We knew we wanted Wendy to be this really memorable, great character. Um, but we weren't entirely sure how to do it. Now, I remember when we were trying to crack the first episode, uh, you and me even came up with an episode. We're like, what if the first episode like Dipper's got a crush on Wendy? Remember yeah. the Bury Your Feelings episode? Mm -hmm. And I remember you, Rob, saying, it's your first episode <laughs> you you have to build to this the writers rarely gave wendy any sort of agency her every action is written through and seen through dipper's pov maybe i should see other people when he lays on her bra or has his face shoved into her boobs wendy's reaction doesn't get spotlighted She's consistently, completely unfazed. That is what we would call the male gaze. Male gaze! If they were male gaze, we wouldn't have to worry about that. I like the, the laying on the bra thing is maybe one of my favorite, uh, like, awkward yeah. kid moments. Cause I was, yeah. man, I, man was I terrified of, uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, other sex's underpants yeah. and underwears when I was that age. I think the writers respected Wendy as a character, but she was primarily seen as a vehicle for Dipper's character growth rather than her own character. We're looking for sources of conflict. Yeah. Story comes from conflict, and the best conflict comes from a deep yearning, not just a superficial annoyance, and the best conflicts are social conflicts. Yeah. So we kept going to this well for Dipper because we know that when a character is maximally motivated, they're the most desperate to do the most insane things. Yes. A character as desperate as Dipper in love is desperate enough to smack the phone out of Robbie's hand. Wendy appears in 16 episodes during the first season and features prominently in eight. With the exception of Boss Mabel, 
all of her major roles revolve around Dipper's feelings for her, and features him as the protagonist of the storyline she appears in. She only has a small handful of lines in the other eight episodes. Of the 46 writing credits distributed across the first season, only three contributions were from women. This was probably, at this point in the season, maybe the third or fourth story that was motivated by Dipper's crush on Wendy. Oh, yeah. Um, and this is something where I think... I don't know if I would do it differently in retrospect, but I do remember when this episode came out, I was expecting people were just going to be like, yeah, slam dunk, nailed it. And there was a lot of response to this episode, which was... Like, oh, another Dipper's in love with Wendy episode. Due to pretty unanimous negative perception amongst the fan base, Dipper got over his crush on Wendy early in the second season. Except then later he didn't. I don't know. The writers had a chance to remove Wendy from Dipper's shadow now. Instead, she basically stops appearing and is a major player in only two episodes before the Weird Mageddon finale. The fact that Wendy didn't participate in the show's turning point, not what he seems in A Tale of Two Stands, basically puts to rest any notion of her actually being a main character. Wendy and Ford didn't even interact once. Pacifica and Ford interacted, but Wendy and Ford didn't. Because by the time Ford was introduced, the writers had moved on from Wendy. Of the 59 writing credits distributed across the second season, four contributions came from Shion Dakushi, and that's it. She made Inside Job on Netflix. Women tend to write women characters better than men, and with practically no women in that writer's room, I think Wendy's characterization suffered. She doesn't also have hobbies or goals or like interests like the other characters do. I know, right? And I feel like they could have been like, oh, she doesn't like lumberjacking like the rest of her family. She fucking, she likes painting. She looks like she would paint. Give that bitch a brush. <laughs> Give her a brush. We know what Seuss does when he goes home. He plays video games, he microwaves hot dogs. We know what Mabel does. We know what Dipper does. We know what Stan does. We never see Wendy on her own. Her whole life in the show revolves around the other characters. We know that she does lumberjackery, presumably. We know that her family are lumberjacks. We never see her do a lumberjacky thing. And when she has any downtime, which is the entirety of like her job there, she's like never doing anything. She's always like reading a magazine or something or like just not paying attention. And I'm like, there's no way this woman just zones out her entire life. Like she has to have something she likes to do. You know what I was thinking? Wendy lost her mother. She doesn't have a mom anymore. Yeah, and you're telling me that doesn't affect her? her. <laughs> <laughs> But you're telling me she's not emotionally affected by losing her the, mom? Like, there's so much to explore there. Exactly. The one feminine influence in her life. And also, they fucking should have given her a, a fucking paintbrush. I feel, like, I feel like she is a painter. Do you get painter energy from her? It's like the Penguins of Madagascar episode where the elephant learns how to paint. But instead of an elephant, it's, it's Wendy. Wendy. When writing Gravity Falls Adventures, the default cast was always Dipper, Mabel, Seuss, and Stan. Rarely Wendy. Why couldn't she have gone to Mini Golf? Or the Pterodactyl Hunt? Or into Stan's Mind? Why not swap Seuss out for her every once in a while? And I think the answer is that Seuss is a more fleshed out character with a lot more potential for storylines and jokes. That's the issue. Oh, j just thinking about this episode gives me some traumatic oh. flashbacks. Why? We were very late, late into the season, um, and... There was an episode that we were working on that we could not for the life of us crack. It was going to be an epi a episode about Wendy um, that was like, I always wanted to do a Wendy episode. I think she's a great character, and I felt that like it would be a crime to end the series without an episode all about her. And so we tried to come up with one, and th there was an outline, and it was about... Uh, it was about her sort of relationship with her family and her insane lumberjack dad. Um, but oh my gosh. It, it involved her at some point getting weather controlling powers. Um, like, because we needed magic, we needed something that was like a con connection to the magic of the world. Um, and some somehow that was the thing that we wound up with. And it, it didn't work, it felt too crazy. Wendy's a really grounded character. Um, and so it's sort of like, it's something we kind of come up with in the room. And then when the script came back, it was, you know, through no fault of the writer, it wasn't working. And we were really behind, and I realized I had a choice, which is we could either produce this episode that really didn't seem in character for Wendy, or I could write a new episode in two days. Oh my gosh. Um, and so, the last Mabel Corn was born. The writing staff got cold feet every time they tried to develop Wendy past her initial characterization. 
Really, the only layer that gets peeled back is this one line of dialogue from Society of the Blind Eye. Okay, I'm not actually laid back. I'm stressed like 24 seven. Have you met my family? We're just told and not shown that there's more to this character. It's never explored nor mentioned again. When someone's putting up this attitude where you don't care about anything that's happening around you, it's generally because you care too much and you learned that when you show other people that you do care, that there are negative reactions that come with that. So it would be cool to show like what kind of pressures she had growing up or what kind of pressures there are around her. I feel like it would be really interesting to have an episode where she kind of cracks. Even more episodes about Wendy were conceived during the show's production. Michael Rayanda tweeted an outline of an episode which would have seen Wendy take the group on a road trip as a means of getting away from her dad, featuring some flashbacks to her childhood, and a showdown with a ghost at a David Lynch-style diner. Perhaps the most well-known canceled Wendy storyline is the B-plot of an episode Alex Hirsch spoke about at the 2015 Comic Con. Wendy has basically been taken to task by her dad for always getting into trouble. We were grounded, and she's ticked off, so while she's ticked off, she actually, she shoplifts some stuff from the mystery shack. And her uncle Stan has surveillance, and he catches Wendy shoplifting, and he calls her into his office and he's like, Wendy, we gotta talk. She's like, oh, I'm so sorry, Mr. Pines, I know, I know I'm in trouble. At the end of the day, the writers of Gravity Falls just never put in the legwork to make these windy scripts come together and always chose to prioritize other episodes they thought would come out better. And that was probably for the best, the other episodes we got were pretty dang good. But if every attempt to develop Wendy was deemed less interesting than another episode not about her, that showcases a problem with how the character was conceived. I think Wendy is a very interesting case study regarding the roles of female characters in general. She was conceived during the beginning of this era where strong female representation was built upon defying traditional stereotypes of femininity. In the mid to late 2010s, strong female characters were physically strong and capable fighters. The creative teams behind these women tended to overwhelmingly consist of men. And I think these men were well-intentioned, trying to show little girls that they can be badass fighters as well, and this was generally very well received at the time by women. We have Valkyrie, who's playing a kind of character I never thought I'd seen in a million years, which is essentially the kind of unlovable, drunk ne'er-do-well that I only see in a Han Solo, and I'm seeing Tessa Thompson be it. 
After decades of films depicting women as needy damsels requiring rescue, and a massive oversaturation of Disney mass-produced girly pop stars, the pendulum rapidly swung in the opposite direction to create a slew of women who really liked punching people. Clueless and Mean Girls were both movies intended to kind of make fun of how this girly teenager is acting, and I think the next 10 years in media are just kind of spent dogging on that. Like, hey, I think we can all... <laughs> I think... Tori Vega, I think we all... <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know what you're referencing. <laughs> Even the best Transformers character, Professor Princess, was criticized as an offensive girly stereotype. She. She's like this Elmira sort of weird pinky princess. She reminds me of something you'd see on Powerpuff Girls. Very patronizing stuff. Very patronizing. How? How is it patronizing? Are you, are you saying that that's all girls are good for? Is just flowers and rainbows? Sugar and spice and everything nice. That's what Powerpuff Girls taught me. It's true though. Hold it right there, Professor Princess! We were witnessing this mainstream cultural rejection of traditional femininity. Okay, okay, don't hurt yourself. Disney was getting on board and practically leading the cultural resurgence against the stereotype they spent decades cultivating. Even down to the Disney Channel, the character Girl vs. Monster from the movie Girl vs. Monster is a fearless, athletic badass who shoots a gun and showcases no traditionally womanly traits outside of a pink jacket, which went hard. I that think... was a really good jacket. I know, right? <laughs> I wanted that as a kid. The most important part of that era of female characters is the fact that they weren't just shown as like strong and combat trained characters they were also shown having this like weird aversion towards anything girly like Katniss Everdeen she's a really big one from the Hunger Games just like this dystopian era in young adult novels just churned out this like massive population of really tough girls and that would not be an issue or a problem, that they're like good at fighting and that they're strong if they wouldn't reject like other feminine aspects. Like Annabeth Chase from Percy Jackson, Piper McLean from the Heroes of Olympus series. Piper is the daughter of Aphrodite and she says, oh, I'm so embarrassed to have her be my mom, and she's so uncomfortable in the dress that she gets claimed in when she finds out that she's the daughter of Aphrodite. And it's like, what's wrong with feeling pretty? And I specifically remember reading these kinds of books and having the female protagonist write, like, in their thoughts, say, Ew, I don't want to wear a dress. Oh, I hate the color pink. And it's like, what are you trying to tell me, bestie? What's wrong with the color pink? <laughs> Gary, go, go. From movies to TV to YA novels, these characters weren't like the other girls, and therefore they were better. I think many of the strong women characters who arrived during this era shared the same problems as Wendy, and they were dragged along by the narrative from set piece to set piece. But now, everything has changed dramatically. A strong woman in 2022 is a woman who embraces her femininity. I've gotten tired of seeing the strong female character just become the tough, mean, cynical, bitter female character. That's not a role model for anyone to look up to, girl or boy. The movie makers need to make these characters as stoic and masculine as possible and voluntarily create a narrative that a woman who is anything but tough and dominating cannot be considered powerful which sends a very unfortunate message to girls. Punching baddies and firing guns does not a strong woman make. Sure, maybe it equates to physical strength, but when we talk about strong characters, we're talking about strength of will, disposition, and mind. And none of you fuckers can write that shit for whatever reason. Probably misogyny. Jennifer Walters and Kamala Khan aren't built like Gamora and Nebula from the previous decade. They're vulnerable. They don't act ashamed to be women. Then obviously Jen's strong when she becomes 
the She-Hulk. That's that's different. She's you know a Hulk. I haven't seen that show because it looks really bad. <laughs> Within the span of just a few years, everything's flipped back to how it was in the 2000s. And I just find it fascinating how rapidly the popular opinion changed. I can think of two possible reasons, and I'm sure there's far more contributing factors than this, but these are just the only ones that I can detect with my small brain. First off, much of the 2010s feminism was spawned by Joss Whedon. Hello! Ah! Ah! <laughs> it's just me! Joss Whedon. He was basically the face of Hollywood feminism for a long time, until the late 2010s when his reputation was permanently tanked by countless accusations of racism and sexism on the set of Justice League. People started thinking like, hey, wait a minute, why does he keep overly sexualizing all of these strong women? And the tide of public opinion shifted against him and against many of the ideals that he stood for. I believe that a second cause is the mainstream acceptance of the transgender community in the United States. Trans women tend to openly celebrate and parade traditional femininity to highlight the progress of their transition. Trans people have a larger platform than they've ever had before, and that they really didn't have as recently as 10 years ago. And they've helped lead the cultural pushback against the cultural pushback against the negative stigma of gender roles. The over 10 window has shifted. I don't really know what that means, but I think I'm using it right. I was like, did you say that word right? Anyways, if you think you're a woman, then you are a woman. Professor Princess and Black Widow can coexist. They can be buddies. The end. We'll destroy them all. Normally, I don't have meaningful discussions at all on this channel. The whole previous six minutes was an accident today. It was a typo. My apologies. Back to Wendy. At the end of the day, Wendy Corduroy really deserved better. She was a byproduct of an era where female characters were shying away from having weaknesses as a cultural pushback against decades of stereotypes. Unfortunately, Wendy, as well as many fictional women like her, proved as one note as their historical predecessors. The story treated her as a vehicle for Dipper's growth, and she didn't have much value to the storyline beyond that, making Wendy the only series lead with no solo adventures to show for herself. That kind of sucks to have a negative ending like that. I didn't. Well, I, I forgot to have a nice ending. All right, Gretchen, <laughs> what's your ideal Wendy storyline? Okay, picture this. So her and her 7,000 brothers and her one big dad, and I'm guessing she has one large dad because she couldn't afford a mother, so she just <laughs> double-sized the father. Her 7,000 brothers and her big, big dad are like, Wendy, let's go into the woods and we're gonna chop the woods. And she's just like, no, dad, that's your dream. 7,000 brothers, that's your dream. <laughs> Me! I want to paint! And she paints this painting, and it's it's of this beautiful willow, and it's, um... Oh, a willow's a tree, not a bird. You know what? It's a it's a beautiful willow tree, and it's, it's, its leaves are red because it's fall, but that's supposed to kind of allude to Wendy and her red hair. Can the episode be about how her dad is completely insane and raised her? Is your girl parts doing the, the drippy thing? That's disgusting. <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> We don't want you to get that on the trees. <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, oh, it's so hard to live with my family. My 7,000 brothers are, are just clogging the toilet constantly. And they can never go to the bathroom. What would be like the monster in that episode? There has to be something supernatural in a Gravity Falls episode. You have, have to be like emotionally tied to Wendy or her mother or something. What if it's like her mother's ghost? Yes, so I actually know the answer to this question. So her mother um, did not die. Her mother is actually a tree, and um, before she was a tree, she was a human woman. Commission! And late at night, she was wandering through the woods, because they live in the woods, and that's the only thing we know about their family. And she was like, ah, oh, man, I wish I wasn't ginger, and I wish I didn't live in the woods. I wish I, I was something else. And then um, the Triangle Man. Bill? Mr. Yeah. Bill Cipher? Yeah. Bill, Bill can't come until he's summoned by Gideon later. But it could be like some other powerful being comes down. Ariana Grande comes down, and she's like, how can I help you? <laughs> Commission! Wendy's mom is like, man, fucking, I'm just kind of tired. I got 7,000 boys I gotta raise. 
<laughs> but my wonderful daughter is like kind of good at finger painting. Wendy would be like three at this point. And Ariana Grande is like, yeah, but if you were a tree and <laughs> she was like, okay. <laughs> She's like a genie or something, and she's like, I just want to get away from it. And Ariana Grande genie's like, yeah, what you're a tree. A tree. <laughs> and so <laughs> Wendy's like, oh fuck, where's my mom? But as a three year old, <laughs> I'm a huge fan of pointless retcons that add nothing. So I think we should have a flashback where Wendy's mom takes a picture of her and her seven thousand brothers from Double Dipper, and that was like the last day they saw her, and then she disappeared. And so Wendy's always painting pictures of trees because in her dreams, her mom speaks to her and she's like, Wendy, it's me, I'm a tree. And Wendy's like, I really fucking am like really inspired by this fucking tree. And Dipper's like, whoa, is she into me? Cause like the, the pine tree thing is like my thing. And then she's just like, no bitch, my mom's a fucking tree. And then that's retroactively explains the deeper subtext of her switching hats with Dipper because she wants to be emotionally closer to her mom. <laughs> and the 7,000 brothers, they get confused by all these paintings of trees. So they start fucking chopping her paintings in half. <laughs> <laughs> so then Dipper and Mabel go with Wendy to find the tree that's her mom. And maybe Ford goes along with them and it turns out like 30 years ago, Ford dated Wendy's mom, but then she broke up with him when he went insane. And he's like, I can't believe Ariana Grande turned my ex-girlfriend into a tree. And her dad's just like, I'm gonna fucking chop down these trees. Dad, this is our mom. No, oh, daughter, this is a tree. We chop these down. Wendy should like chain herself to the tree that's her mother to prevent Manly Dan from trying to chop it down. Yeah. <laughs> Is that her dad's name? Manly Dan, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he sure as fuck is. So what happens to the mom at the end of this episode that we just wrote by ourselves? Does Ariana Grande come back? Is she the villain for like evilly turning the mom into a tree? So Ariana Grande's booked at this point. She's in the new Wicked movie, so she doesn't have time to oh, come I see. down. <laughs> Wendy has to like fight Ariana Grande genie essentially as like revenge. And then she finally gets to her mom to not be a tree anymore. By and painting then... the most beautiful picture known to man, and Ariana Grande's like, whoa, that's so sick. And she's like, that's so sick that it makes me want to kind of rethink my artistry. And so she becomes an actress as well as a oh, singer. Yeah. And now she's in the Wicked movie. Then Stan and Seuss have a B-plot where they like, <laughs> I don't know, they unclog the toilet for 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah, they're like, yo, we gotta get these 7,000 brothers out of here, dog. <laughs> no, Manly Dan, Manly Dan, at the end, he has an emotional reunion with his wife again. And she's who kept him sane. So it's because she disappeared because Ariana Grande turned her into a tree. Yes. And that's why he went all crazy. But yeah. now that his wife is back, she's a stabilizing presence in Manly Dan's life. And Wendy has reunited her family. Exactly. Do you think that's why he chops down trees, trying to look for his wife? Oh my god! <laughs> Alex Hirsch is literally pissing and shitting himself because of these ideas and how um, good they were. All of them, actually. My brain, <laughs> it inspires me <laughs> to not have it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> this video is sponsored by She-Hulk on Disney+. Plus. Go stream She-Hulk on Disney+. Plus.